The Russian Federation have just revealed a cruise missile test they claim to be successful for something called the Budavestnik. NATO calls it Skyfall. Ooh. Now, I'm personally a more Casino Royale man myself, but here's why this Budavestnik, this new cruise missile, is making headlines. The Budavestnik is a low-altitude, long-range cruise missile that is double nuclear. Mm. Let me explain that. Nuclear-armed, okay, we've seen loads of those, but also nuclear-powered, like a submarine. Meaning you can strap a nuke to the end of a missile like this, uh, or several nukes, why not, uh, for those city-flattening horror scenarios that the world most definitely does not need any of. Uh, but also, this thing, the thing that really sets this missile apart is that it's nuclear-powered. So it's not solid fuel or liquid fuel that runs out at the end and the rocket fizzles out and therefore it has a specific range, 400 kilometers, 600 kilometers, oh no. It's got a small nuclear reactor in it that provides the propulsion for the missile to keep going. This is what has analysts shocked and in some cases awed, uh, as it means theoretically these missiles could have unlimited range. That's the clickbaity title you see here. <coughs> it's theoretically unlimited range though, uh, because nuclear fuel doesn't really run out quickly. You a lot of the times actually have to manually shut it down to prevent a runaway chain reaction. Now, Russia conducted tests around October 21st, a few days ago, literally a week, and although not independently verifiable uh, from the outside, the Russian state at least says the tests were a success. Just checking if my mic's on. The claim is that the Budavestnik or Skyfall missile was flown for around 15 hours straight, right? No landing or anything. It's a missile after all. Imagine this thing flying at potentially several times the speed of sound for 15 hours straight, over 14,000 kilometers through low altitude before being slammed into a dummy target and, you know, calling it a day. Now, the unlimited range is theoretical. Why, Muffles? Well, because it's theoretically unlimited in the same way a nuclear submarine can stay underwater, theoretically, for decades, right, for tens of years. Other factors, though, are at play on a submarine, like humans on a sub actually needing to come to the surface for new supplies of food and other supplies, maybe meeting family members, right, touching some grass. <laughs> so, uh, similarly... Uh, this missile has other factors, not just the uh, propulsion uh, fuel source, which is nuclear. It has other factors like the fluids being used as lubrication, uh, guidance systems and other control systems that have their own power sources themselves. All of those can run out. Uh, the, the airframe, sorry, uh, that's a big one to mention. The airframe, the outside body of the missile, all of those can run out, right? In the uh, case of uh, fuel, uh, sorry, fluid. And in the case of the missile's body, the airframe, it can degrade due to atmospheric contact, friction, burning, and all, all that. Uh, so the nuclear engine would be able to carry on, theoretically, but the rest of the missile has its earlier limits. So it does actually have a range. Now, America uh, tried something similar to the Budavestnik in the 1960s during the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Uh, the plans were scrapped, though, as the missile proved too complicated uh, relative to ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, that were also being developed in parallel at the time. So this project, I think it was called Project Pluto by America, was dropped. They were like, this is this is too complicated. There's uh, environmental problems. We'll, we'll get to that uh, later in the video. Um, we're having containment challenges, and the ICBMs are much easier to do. They're much more effective. They can probably go into the atmosphere. They can land. No one can stop it. And that, that that's good enough for us. Okay, let's scrap the other one, right? You see, there was a danger that these types of missiles, these long, uh, low-altitude, long-range missiles, uh, could be shot out of the sky more easily, i.e. intercepted, because they, they're flying 50 to 100 meters off the ground. That's not high at all. Uh, there was also a worry as to how to get rid of the nuclear reactor powering the damn thing without making a radioactive mess, a spill, uh, that would definitely not be able to tell friend from foe. Now, I'm going to be honest here. 1960 was, you know, 65 years ago. I don't know if... I don't know if and how Russians have improved on those scrapped American plans. I don't know if uh, the Russians have a reliable way to shut down the missile's uh, nuclear reactor so it doesn't lead to radioactive waste being, you know, pepper sprayed across the entire missile flight path, which could be, you know, potentially 20,000 kilometers. Yo, ugh, that's a lot of radiation, right? But if they do, if they have worked out some way, then this is what it all boils down to. Russia has a piece of military technology developed and tested that even America does not have. 
not because America couldn't have it if they wanted it, but because it was a project that was scrapped at the time and so far as the public knows, so far as I could find, the project was not restarted. Now, a low-flying, hard-to-intercept, high-speed missile that's literally cruising, you know, perusing for a bruising to deliver uh, for upwards of 15 hours, oof, potentially 20,000 kilometers in range. Oof. Analysts say that is definitely something for Russia's adversaries to worry about, adversarial uh, states to the Russian Federation. But not in the way you think. They shouldn't worry that, oh, this is going to come cruising into my homeland or my home uh, airspace. No. You see, the main bit of marketing this missile is getting is that it gives Russia, from the Russian side, sorry, the main marketing is getting is that it gives Russia an all-important second strike capability, an additional second strike capability, meaning if we get nuked, we can nuke back. So don't nuke us, right? You can be sure we, we have, we'll have that ability because we've got something in the air that's just flying around for 15 hours. You can't stop them all. How, how many do we have flying around for 15 hours? You never know. So, you know, YOLO, you can YOLO it by trying to nuke us, but we will cruise in and nuke you back. That's the threat from the Russian side. If that line of thinking is to be believed, that Russia is seeing this as a second strike tool, uh, if that's the primary objective of the Budovestnik or the Skyfall, then Russia is just further building, uh, sorry, <clears throat> then Russia is just further uh, building up their nuclear capabilities, not for offensive use, but for deterrence and defensive use. Now, I'm not saying they should be believed in that claim, but my analytical position on nuclear weapons, as you guys might know from the past, for any nation that has nuclear weapons, not just the global south or the, the, the western world, no. My analytical take is, in this modern age, the use of nukes are primarily a defensive deterrent tool, a way for administrations to say, you cannot overthrow us from the outside. If you try to invade, if you occupy the capital, you overthrow the government, we have nukes, we will fire them before you get that far. Because our government has that ability to deploy those nukes. Uh, so if we go down, if this administration goes down, we're taking you flipping all with Well, let's all go down, right? That's the, that's the promise. That's the threat. So, you, so it makes basically nations with nuclear weapons un, un-regime changeable, right? It's a defensive anti-regime change deterrence. That would, that's my assessment. But of course, that's just my analysis of the situation. I could be absolutely wrong. And one of these nuclear armed countries could go on the offensive and decide, yeah, I'm going to go first. I'm going to defend myself over there. We know some countries think like that. Um, so in that case, you know, wear something nice if World War Three breaks out, if it's your first world war. Uh, and for the unbiased news and analysis without the Western spin, I'm Mahfuz and uh, I will see you on the next one.